Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining our session. This talk is about our approach to platform engineering for manufacturing at the LEGO Group, and we will just dive right into it. So let's talk about LEGO bricks. First off, quick show of hands. How many of you have ever uh, built a LEGO set before? <laughs> nice. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, so the LEGO Group is a toy manufacturing company, and we produce a wide range of different toys, um, like the ones you see here, and we produce these at our factories around the world. So what you see here is one part of the manufacturing. Uh, these are molding machines. So these are the actual machines that produce the Lego bricks and the Lego elements. And when the fresh bricks come out, they end up in those baskets or the boxes that you see at the very end of the machines. If you look at this, maybe there's something that stands out to you. There's not a lot of people in these pictures, right? So automation is a big part of the manufacturing at the Lego Group. Um, and it's all IT dependent. So software supports the manufacturing. And this is a software that the digital teams at the Lego Group are writing. If we look at this case, what happens next is at some point these boxes will fill up. They're not magical. Um, and we have in the lower right corner, you can see a blue vehicle. That's an automatic guided vehicle. So this is a robot, essentially, that patrols the factory floor. Uh, when the box is full, it will come over, swap out the box with a, an empty one, and the machine continues to produce. And the full box will go on to the next step in the process. So this is one example where automation comes in uh, for our manufacturing. And this is the environment that we operate in. This is where we produce software and, and support our teams. If we zoom out just a little bit, we have these factories across the world. Um, so we're in six locations right now. Uh, seventh will open in the near future. Not all factories do all the same parts of the whole manufacturing process, but what is common is that we have data centers at these uh, factories. And whenever we talk about Edge in this talk, this is, these are the locations that we refer to. Um, so essentially, this is what our talk will be about. How do we do platform engineering for a context like this? Um, hope you're ready for it. Thank you. OK, so now you've seen a little bit about our factories. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about how we organize uh, the people in the group. So we are a, uh, a bunch of digital builders, software engineers that are doing these uh, integrations that uh, Jeppe just talked about. We are around. 1,200 software engineers in the LEGO group. We produce a bunch of code, uh, and we have, and this is uh, important for the rest of the talk, we have a bunch of digital products. We have around 250 individual, different, um, individual digital products that support uh, our various processes. So looking at this a little bit, so imagine the, the green figures you have in the top here. These are colleagues that are doing, well, you can call it real work. These are the colleagues that are actually managing the molding machines. These are the colleagues that are producing the bricks. Now imagine that you need some kind of digital support of these processes. It could be automation, it could be some applications they need, or it could just be a proper setup of, uh, of software. We don't want these people who are in the direct value chain to be doing this work. So therefore, we have these, uh, this uh, concept of digital enablement. So that's done by a bunch of teams, and they, they do this direct enablement. Now, these teams might need things like databases, or they might need some stateful things that are common across all of these products. Again, we don't want those colleagues to have to do that. So instead, we have platform teams that enable them. So to be just a little bit more concrete, so it, you could imagine that you had a factory uh, with molding machines, for instance, and you could imagine that you have people operating those. Maybe you need a digital display that shows something about how this process operates, or maybe you need something that can order a robot to come by. We don't want the operators to be implementing this code, so instead we have a molding technologies uh, product, for instance, and they are doing this work. They might need, for instance, a message broker. They might need a database. We don't want them to be doing that, so instead we build a team. We call them, let's call them the Edge platform. Um, this team delivers stateful services. We don't want that team to also be operating Kubernetes because Kubernetes on-prem, now that's a hard problem. So we could have another team, and so on and so forth. So it's uh, platforms and turtles all the way down, 
until you get to, well, the actual physical uh, factory. Um, so zooming in on the Edge platform, so this platform could be a product that offers up a Mrs. Broker in a database, um, and this platform supports the uh, molding processes and the uh, factory processes across uh, the world. Uh, which brings us to us. Uh, my name is Mask. I am the lead engineer of uh, the Edge platform team. I do the, uh, the roadmaps and the long-term pr planning and engagement with stakeholders. And uh, with me, I have uh, Jebe. Yeah, my name is Jebe. I uh, take the roadmaps and I try to convert them into something that can run. But I also orchestrate the workflows in our teams to make sure that we are working on the right things and, and delivering the value we, we want to do. Yeah. And, and one point that I'll also come back to later is that we are a fairly young team. Um, we've been, I've been at the Lego Group for close to one year, maybe even less. Um, so this talk will also be about how we actually handle this fact that we are uh, somewhat new in what we do. So when we do these digital products, and specifically when we do the things in, in our area, we strive for providing cloud-like experience. Now, this can mean a lot of things, and it, this does mean a lot of different things for different people. But for us, it's very important that this enables self-service. I want to make sure that when we have these various products and they, we give them a choice for what they want to use, that it's a real choice. So they need to be able to self-service uh, and we translate this as we need to provide APIs to our things. Um, sometimes you need a nice graphical user interface for your things, so we also uh, strive to provide our things and make them accessible via our internal development platform. Um, when we then deliver these services, it's also very important that they are robust and they are secure and they support it, because we want to lower that cognitive load of the various teams. And we can only do that by ensuring that they can rely on the products that we are building. So these are uh, some important attributes. Um, later in the talk, I'll talk a little bit about how we build in uh, this into our product. Uh, but before we do that, uh, it's important to talk about how we go about creating an architecture that can actually uh, support these kinds of uh, products. Yes, let's spend a bit of time looking at how a solution like this works, or how we build a self-service platform uh, in the context that I outlined earlier. Um, initially, when we started this out, and we still continue to work uh, based on these principles, um, so initially we set out that we wanted to use the available bricks that we have, so whatever tools and platforms or other product teams we're building, uh, we wanted to use those uh, as much as we could, or cloud-native tools that were available that would fit our need. Uh, and also specifically for our services, we would rely on operators. So we would use the knowledge embedded in operators for each service. Uh, of course, we need to know how a RabbitMQ cluster works in Kubernetes, but actually managing the cluster, we delegate that to operators. We also use GitOps wherever we can. Um, we have different sites, and we want to run the same infrastructure across all our sites and have a nice central way to, to manage that, so we use GitOps where we can. And it also ties well together with the next part, which is we have no direct access to these sites. So we don't have Kubernetes or Kube API uh, access from a central location with pipelines and so on. So we, don't, we treat all the, the edge locations as remote islands, essentially. All right, let's uh, take a look. So our goal is for our colleague we want to enable them to get uh, Redis or RabbitMQ at our factory sites. As I mentioned earlier, we have data centers available at each site. Uh, we have two, DZ1, DZ2. And fortunately, this is one case where we did not have to start from scratch. So we have a container platform available at, uh, at each site. Um, so for now, we will just abstract away from the fact that we have data centers here and, and just look at uh, from a Kubernetes perspective. Uh, we know it's there. We know that there are two data centers in case we want to go into details there. But for now, we abstract away from it. So this could be one location. And we already have a couple of tools that we can make use of uh, to solve our problem. Um, so first of all, we have Argo CD. We have external secrets. Uh, we use those as the primary mechanisms to roll out our infrastructure uh, across our sites. Uh, we use GitOps to roll out our operators, the individual service instances. Um, so in this case, it would be the RabbitMQ operator and RabbitMQ instances. Uh, so we have GitOps repositories that we do have access to. Um, and then it gets pulled in with Argo and from there installed into our locations. 
We also have a secret store. Um, we have secrets that can be pulled in with external secrets in case we need any additional configurations or, or, or secrets. So this is all pool-based. We don't have that direct access to our clusters, but this, these tools allow us to get around that and, and provide us mechanisms for uh, getting all our services out uh, at the edge. If we look a little bit deeper, how we do it, so we create a manifest file. It's the one in the lower left corner. Uh, this, in this case, it could be for a RabbitMQ cluster. We have a small set of values that are essentially input to a Helm chart that would install the RabbitMQ custom resource. We push it to a GitOps repo for a particular site. Uh, then we let Argo CD just pull it in, install it, and then the operator takes over and starts bootstrapping the RabbitMQ cluster. So a little bit, you know, quite easy to get here in some ways. Um, we have this up and running. We are starting to see adoption. So we managed to get here without having to write a lot of code. We, we took the tools we had available and, and put it together. And then we got to this point where we now have the services running in our locations. Um, and then from here, we can go in different directions. So one thing we could do is we could focus on extending our services, so add new services. We have Redis, we have Postgres, and so on. That this was talking about. We want to do that, of course, but we also want to build out the interfaces towards our colleagues. So we also want to provide that self-service and cloud-like experience. So the first thing we do next is we build out an API. So we build the API. This API is going to manage our GitOps repository, any secrets, and then we can expose that for our colleagues. Um, at the layer group, we are API first. That means that every integration we do it's happening via APIs. Uh, we have an internal, uh, you know, in our developer portal, we have access to all the APIs that different teams are producing. So we build out an API, we host it centrally, and then we can give that to our colleagues and they're able to uh, automatically provision a Rabbit cluster or Redis database and so on. From here, we also go one step further. So we have a internal developer portal based on Backstage, um, where which as I mentioned before, has all the APIs. It also has information about the different product teams. Um, in this case, we're building a plugin here to actually provide that cloud-like experience. So you actually get a full plugin uh, in our developer portal. So we have team members working on this now with help from the uh, team that is the product team behind our developer portal. So these are all the steps that we are going through uh, as a team to build a platform uh, for our manufacturing. And this gets us up to the point where our colleague will be able to go in, request a service, uh, get it created, maybe list what they have in their product team. Um, but there's a couple of things that we are still missing. So there's a couple of questions we want answered. One is the actual state of things. So is my RabbitMQ cluster running? And two, sometimes you just want to restart the thing. That's, uh, that's sometimes just needed. So we have a couple of more things we, we want to do. So this is good for creating the desired state at our edge locations and having the Argo CD and so on, the operators, uh, trying to you know, get it to an actual running state. But we also want that running state uh, back and ultimately exposed in our developer portal. So what we also build out is we do a couple more things. We have our observability platform. Data gets pushed out from the sites. And we also build our own little agent that sits in our locations and will push the actual state back out and optionally pull in a command that needs to be executed um, against uh, one of our clusters. So now we're there, you could say. So essentially, we pull our desired state via GitOps out to our locations, and then we push all the information out that we need and want to expose in our developer portal, and that kind of closes the whole loop of what we need to do. So there's a few different components that we need to work on to enable this cloud-like experience. few learnings that we took away from it. Definitely our use of other operators has allowed us to focus on building that full experience. Uh, also the fact that we go out of way to try and use what other product teams in the, at the LEGO group is building and, and use that for us uh, has worked well. Of course, we also needed some things changed in, in certain areas, like uh, in our container platform, we needed permissions to install custom resources. Um, but for the most part, we go out of the way to try and fit into the other teams and their platforms um, as much as possible. 
and then a kind of realization that we definitely need a mix of disciplines to do something like this. I mean, we have the operational side in Kubernetes, we have uh, development of the back end, we have front end for our de internal developer portal with uh, React. So there's quite a mix of disciplines involved in, in building this out. Um, of course, not everyone in the team are doing all the three things, but def we definitely need a mix of uh, experience and skills in our teams. And with that, that's how our current solution looks like and what we're also building out. And let's hear how we actually make sure that the, the thing works. Yep. Let's do that. So you remember just a while ago, I hope you still remember, that I mentioned this thing about our services being repost and supported. Again, remember, we were a somewhat young team. Um, and when I started the team, I had to figure out some approach to ensuring that our things got to the level that we actually needed it uh, to be. We are a product organization, again, digital products, and digital products that are doing digital enablement of a bunch of colleagues. A big thing about being a true product organization is that it's very important for us that the individual teams that maintain the products and are trying to create the best possible solution for an end user, that they actually have a choice. We want to make sure that if they feel that they need to pick a specific database in order to provide a, a certain level of service, then that they are able to do it. We definitely have paved paths. We have uh, things that we want people to use. We have directions we want people to move in. But it's very important for us that people have actual choice, and they do. So when we build out this nice RabbitMQ service, it's fully up to the individual users that we have to choose whether or not they want to use our service. Uh, the alternative could be that they are running them on the, their own VMs, and that might not be a, bad, a good experience. But if that's what they need to do, then that's what they'll do. So in order for us to actually build these services, we have to make sure that we get user adoption. And it's not a given. We can't mandate people to use our services. Um, so we had to come up with a way to make sure that we as a young team could build some pretty uh, critical services for manufacturing that the teams in manufacturing actually wanted to use. Uh, we do some different things, but one of the things that I would like to talk, to, to, uh, talk about today that we use is that we do uh, chaos engineering. So some of you might know that chaos engineering is not necessarily as chaotic as you might think. This is a pretty scientific approach. So in chaos engineering, you make sure to do your research, you make sure to form your hypothesis about what will happen and what you expect to happen. And then you have a controlled way of doing an experiment, and then you go about doing your experiment, conclude, and then you make your service more resilient if you actually need to. Okay, so this is the process. Uh, to simplify it just a little bit, so what we have in the middle is the, uh, the approach we have where we, when we want to test a service, we have some load generation, we have some uh, injection of chaos, uh, and then we have our learnings. Now, surrounding that is the test plan. So we have a plan where we set down and documented what we expect to happen, the various phases that we are going to go through, uh, and what we want to, to prove. Now, the very important thing here, and I don't know whether you remember the first diagram with the colored uh, people, uh, but this thing signifies that we do our test plans with our end users. So we pick some of these colleagues in manufacturing who actually have to support these high-impact uh, high critical processes, uh, and we have them help us understand how best to create uh, these test plans. So if they are very worried about a specific part of how a service works like, well, they have an opportunity now to come with that input, um, and that's uh, why we're doing uh, chaos engineering. So I'll talk a bit about, about what we expect to get out of chaos engineering, and then how we actually did it, um, and then what we, uh, what we got out. So Lego has this thing about um, that uh, even the best is not good enough, roughly translated. The best I forgot in Danish. The idea here is that for the final product, for the bricks, for the sets that we create for our end users, for, for the kids out there, we should strive to make the very best product we can. There's like no limit to how good we can make it, and we should do whatever we can to make it the very best product. Now, as some of you might know, it can be a dangerous thing to take that mindset 
verbatim into a, um, a world where you are running stateful services. Because if you take this uh, verbatim, you risk trying to do, for instance, 100% uptime of your stateful services. And the reality is that that's probably not what your end users necessarily want. Remember, we're going for this uh, cloud-like experience. And if you look at a hyperscaler, if you look at any of the big clouds, and you look at the, the bunch of services they have and all the different features they have, there's just no way that a team like ours would be able to deliver that. So again, not only can we not necessarily do 100% uptime, but it's probably also hard for us to create all these features. So by doing this case engineering, by sitting down with our end users and talking about, so how do we want to actually support this thing? We also provide a space where we can talk about what is good enough. So do you actually need 100% uptime? Do you need 100% uptime during a specific period uh, of, the, of the year? We have, a, as you can imagine, uh, a, a focus on, on staying up throughout uh, Black Friday, for instance, right? So there are maybe phases where you really need to be up, but maybe there are other times of the year where you, where you don't have to. So this provides a safe space where we can talk about the actual robustness uh, of our services and we normalize these discussions about what's, what's good enough. This also provides us a way to learn from our end users. Okay, another thing is that if we turn our um, focus to our teams instead. So again, young team. We are now operating some pretty cr critical stateful services at our sites. How do we make sure that our engineers are actually confident in operating these services? Well, again, by making sure when we run these experiments that we use the same tools as we do in production, we use the same dashboard, we use uh, the same access to the clusters or lack of same, we make sure that our engineers actually have a feeling for how it is to operate these services. Not only operate the services when they work, but also to operate the services when they are failing. Because they've seen what a crash looks like. They've seen how you restore a, a rapid cluster, for instance. Um, this also allows us to discover the various other products that are adjacent to us. So for instance, if we need to do a stress test of, uh, of the storage layer, for instance, we might need to engage with uh, our assistant team that does our compute platform. Now, we don't have the necessary access to go all the way down into the hypervisor and see how it operates, but we, by doing this chaos test and by making sure that in order to do the test, we actually need the data from them, we have an opportunity to engage with them, bring them into the test and actually making them a part of, uh, of the test. So should the day arise where we have an issue in production, well, now we know who to call. We know that that team exists. So all of this is normalizing um, and cultivating a culture around uh, failings and learnings. So by doing this, we normalize the fact that things will fail, but we also drive home the focus on learning from these failures. Um, one, one awesome thing is that now we have a setup where we can allow an existing application to connect to a test cluster in production-like environment, and then we can simulate a crash. Well, we like to do the crash. And this allows our application teams to then figure out whether or not they are able to, for instance, reconnect when the service comes back up. Um, and this is a huge part of treating our customers as colleagues, because they are in a situation like ours where they also have customers that they need to support. Okay, so that's, that's what we wanted to, to get out of it. Um, one strategy that we used when we then got started was to keep things as simple as possible. So we wanted to, to get these early learnings, uh, but we also want to like do the low-hanging fruit first. So we have this 80-20 rule um, where we save our ambitions for later. So you could say that um, in the end, uh, instead of doing a, a, a fancy a load injection where we simulate the e exact um, characteristics of a production load. I mean, if you can do that with a bit of shell script, we'll do that. It will work just fine. You can easily simulate a crashing pod by just deleting it. Okay. Um, so, how do we actually go about doing this? Um, and I would love now to do a live demo. I'm afraid I can't. Uh, we run this in production environments, which means that we actually run these things at our factories and. I mean, we want to keep those bricks flowing. So uh, for now, you'll have to make do with uh, some screenshots. We need some load generation, some case injection, and some monitoring. Um, and I'll walk you through this thing. Um, so when we run the test, 
we are monitoring, and this is f actually from when we did a, a test of, uh, of RabbitMQ. Um, we are monitoring, of course, with metrics, logs, and all that, but we're also just monitoring with the existing RabbitMQ console. So in this picture, you can see that one of the nodes uh, are crashing. Um, how do we then do the, uh, the state state load? Well, as mentioned, we could do something fancy, but actually, we're just scheduling a pod into the cluster um, that are running the stock RabbitMQ load generator. Uh, there's a performance test that comes with RabbitMQ. We started off with that. Later on, if you want to get ambitious, we can do something else. Uh, when it comes to actually injecting the chaos, well, we did a bit of, well, it's Go code, uh, but it's roughly what you saw in the bit of bash before. Delete random parts, we can reproduce this, works just fine. And with this quite simple setup, uh, we already got some stuff out of it. So for instance, we had a test where we wanted to see whether or not uh, we could detect when a, a cluster lost a node and then when the node rejoined. So there was a hypothesis that at some point we should be able to, in the logs, see when this node rejoined. Um, we ran the test and we couldn't. Uh, because it turned out that out of the box uh, we had misconfigured the locks and we could actually not see this thing rejoining. We added this thing in, it was quick fix, quick fix and now we were able to see this. And this, I mean, we could have ended up going into production uh, without this fix if we hadn't done this, uh, this test. Um, also, we are already getting a, a bunch of lovely feedback from our end users. Um, Jaroslav is, is uh, one of the uh, uh, engineers that has been running Rabbit for a long time in the, in the group. Uh, and he is very appreciative of the work we're doing and uh, telling us again and again that he, uh, he loves that we actually take so much care about doing uh, this work. Um, and I believe that a lot of this comes from our willingness to engage again through these uh, chaos experiments, where we're not afraid of demonstrating that things can crash. Um, and then when it comes to more ambitions, because of course we need to go deeper into this, we need to look at other tools. Uh, we're actually having a colleague right now who's doing his uh, master thesis on this, uh, and we're, we're working with more chaos engineering. Um, and we'll go deeper into this uh, for sure. Then let's talk a little bit about uh, our takeaways. Yes, so we're coming a bit to an end. Uh, a few final words we, we want to, to close this with. Um, first of all, having worked with this for, for since last summer, uh, as Mas mentioned, um, for us having worked in this environment has proven to us that you know, doing cloud native but in an on-prem environment has never been easier for us. We recognize that we have our container platform team, we have our compute team, we have our networking that did a lot of the hard work to set this up for us. But at this point, we can use a lot of the cloud native tools. They solve our problems. We saw how we use Argo to get around. We don't have that access to our, our, our edge locations. So this has been quite an eye opener for us. Of course, we sit close with our, our parts of the container platform team. So it also helps that, that we are close and we are physically together in the, in the office. Um, but also the product focus that, has, that Matt mentioned has really shines through. Um, the fact that we, we, you are not forced to use what our teams are building. Uh, we want to build for the experience for our colleagues. So they want to use the services that we build and the platforms um, definitely shines through and it helps a lot in terms of, of uh, making it accessible for, for each other. Um, and for us, the, the, the focus on integrating with APIs has been essential for, for making this possible. Also for building out the, the self-service part, uh, we started, we were building out the uh, internal developer portal uh, plugin, but down the road may add other interfaces in the end. Uh, but as long as we have the API, we can start adding depending on what our colleagues want, uh, also depending on the specific services. So, yeah. And just to double down on this thing, if you have a way to get some early value, then go for it. I mean, if it requires a bit of bash, just do that. There are some awesome tools for case engineering. We'll definitely look at them later. But we just learn a lot by just doing what more or less equates to a, a bit of bash. So remember to do that if you have the opportunity. Now, if you took notice, the, the architecture that Yebis stepped you through was quite different. There was no bash in there, there was a lot of YAML, um, and we were just picking from the landscape. So when you're doing foundational things, we are now coming to a phase where we have some pretty robust projects out there. Make sure to use them. 
build your layers carefully and make sure to integrate them. Um, and yes, it does mean that you're not doing as much custom code as you might like to, uh, and in the end, uh, you will just be a YAML engineer. Um, but I, w I will say that, remember that this is saving you some time, uh, and I would suggest that you take that time, invest that with your friends and family, and then maybe go out, find some Lego sets, and uh, do some awesome builds. Uh, and with that, I would like to, uh, I mean, thank the community for creating this awesome landscape. I would like to thank all of you, all of you being uh, curious about what we are doing. Um, we will definitely uh, keep returning and uh, sharing our experiences. And uh, I'd like to thank, thank all our awesome colleagues who have made uh, this thing uh, possible. So thank you all. Thank you.